You see, after all, the Bible says that we are made in God's image. In other words, we reflect God. Because God is a person, we are persons. And because God is emotional, we too are also emotional. We have emotions. So God can be both loving, good, and angry because his anger is actually driven by his love. Hello and welcome to Sandals Church. We are all about this vision of being real and there is a place for you here. You know, right now we're in this series called When and Rome and we get to hear from Pastor Alfredo Ramos. And this series is all about how to live a life for Christ in a culture that doesn't. So we're so glad you're joining us today. Enjoy the message. What's good, Sandals Church? I am honored to be with you guys today as we continue in our series, When in Rome. And today we're actually going to be talking about something that we are all very good at, and yet at the same time, it could be incredibly harmful to our lives. And that is living in denial. If we're going to be honest with ourselves, we all struggle at times to come to terms with reality and just accept the truth. And medical professionals, doctors, sociologists, psychologists have all affirmed this. This is something that we all do naturally. and We're all pretty good at it as humans. And they also say that it's not always a bad thing. In fact, living in denial can be healthy. It can help us. It's a, a coping mechanism, especially when something bad or traumatic has happened in our lives. We will say things like, man, I can't believe this is real. We'll go into kind of this moment of shock. Maybe when you've lost someone and you're just like, gosh, this, I don't believe this happened. We live in this kind of state of denial. And again, it can be a helpful thing. It helps us to process. But what these medical professionals also point out is that at some point, this can only be temporary. And all of us must cross the bridge to reality and begin to accept what is, come to terms with what is true. But we just don't. It's much more comfortable just to live in denial. And we do this all the time. We, we live in denial about our relationships. Even though family and friends have told us, man, yo, that dude is toxic. That girl is no good for you. And we'll say to ourselves, yeah, well, man, how, how can they be so bad when they look so good? And they, they feel so good. We're in denial about our jobs, whether we like them or not. We live in denial about our emotions, not being honest about where we're actually at. We kind of just write things off. We're good. We live in denial about our decision making when it comes to our finances and the kind of trouble that we have gotten ourselves into. We live in denial about our habits and what they're doing to our lives and maybe even the lives of those around us. We are people who live in denial. And you know, what's funny is we can often see other people living in their denial, but we cannot see it in ourselves. But thankfully today, I believe God has a word for us from Romans 1 that's going to help us not just see how we live in denial, but he's going to show us a way out. And so let's read together from Romans chapter 1, starting in verse 18. The Apostle Paul says this there to the Christians. For God's wrath is revealed from heaven against all godlessness and unrighteousness of people who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Since what can be known about God is evident among them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, that is, his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen since the creation of the world, being understood through what he has made. As a result, people are without excuse. For though they knew God, they did not glorify him as God or show gratitude. Instead, their thinking became worthless, and their senseless hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man, birds, four-footed animals, and reptiles. This is God's word. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, that you are here with us. We thank you for your word. And God, I ask now that you would speak to us from your word. 
Open our eyes and open our hearts so that we might see what it is that you are calling us to do and we might return to you in the process. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, you might have noticed from this passage here in Romans 1, this is the letter again that Paul wrote to the church in Rome. He packs a lot in just these short few words. And to help us understand where he's going, there's really four questions that I'm going to use for us as we journey along together today. The first is, what are we in denial about? Secondly, why we live this way? Third, what happens when we do this? And fourth, how to move forward. What we're in denial about, why we do it, what happens when we do it, and how to move forward. So let's begin. What are we in denial about? Simply put, Paul says this. We know God, but suppress the truth. We push it away. We pretend as if it doesn't exist. And Paul, and really the entire story of the Bible, is trying to say this to all of us. That the the biggest problem with all of us as human beings, at the very root of it all, is this. We deny God. We live in a state of denial about who he is. And what that means for our lives. And that, friends, is the root of all of our problems. We deny God. Look what he says there in verse 18. For God's wrath is revealed from heaven against all godlessness and unrighteousness of people who by their unrighteousness, circle this phrase, pay attention to it, take note, suppress the truth. Since what can be known about God is evident among them because God has shown it to them. Now, before we get any further, I I know that this might feel kind of harsh, a little bit abrasive, right? The first three words, for God's wrath, his, his anger. I know some of us are already like, man, there we go. Angry Christians, angry, narrow minded Christians talking about their, their angry and wrathful, narrow minded God. But let's listen for a second. Let's consider this as we think about the anger of God. We shouldn't just naturally project the what we've seen before as poor expressions of anger. You and I all know uh, people, uh, spouses, uh, parents, bosses even, right? We've seen unhealthy, unhinged, just out of control anger and wrath and how destructive and violent it can be. Not so with the anger of God. God's wrath, God's anger, it's always fair. God's anger is always right and it is always perfectly in proportion to that which he is angry at. He's never unhinged. He's never out of control. But more than that, I think we also struggle with this idea that God is angry because it's hard for us to reconcile that with a God who we believe is also loving or good. Either he's loving and good or he's kind of just this angry, mean person up there in the sky and in the heavens. But imagine for a second that it's, it's both and. In fact, I would even tell you that it's because of God's love and goodness that he gets angry at times. His anger is motivated and driven by his love. I know this just as a parent, man. As a young, as a young dad, I got two young children who are full of life and smiles and just pure evil at times. Even just working on this message, I I can hear as I'm trying to have this kind of peaceful experience with God and figure out what I need to say. And behind me is just chaos as my kids do and say things that we have just asked them not to do and not to say. And I get up from my chair and I go over to them and, and I have this bizarre sensation within me in which I am deeply angry. And at the same time, I still have deep affection and love for them. And we all know why that is, because we, we as people, we're emotional people, and our emotions are complex, where both can be true, not either or. And if that's true on our human level, how much more true do you think that is when it comes to God and his emotions? You see, after all, the Bible says that we are made in God's image. In other words, we reflect God. Because God is a person, we are persons. And because God is emotional, we too are also emotional. We have emotions. So God can be both loving, good, and angry because his anger is actually driven by his love. But I think lastly, though, especially for some of you who are watching and maybe you're unsure about Christianity still, you're on the fence a little bit about it, and you imagine, well, if God exists, I just don't ever really think he would be or she would be upset. 
ever be mad. But, and I think what you really might be saying at the end of the day is that if God's real, I don't think we would ever disagree with each other. And that, friend, just seems impossible to imagine. I mean, you've never met a person in your life in which you agreed with everything they do. I don't even agree with Fredo, and that's me. Most of the time, I don't even agree with the things that I'm deciding to do. So how can we possibly imagine that if God exists, that he would always be just good with us? There has to be a moment where we consider, man, God can be angry, and his anger can be driven by his love for us. That's what Paul is getting at. God is angry, and his anger is not just something in the past or in the future. Paul says it's being revealed from heaven now against godlessness and unrighteousness. These are, I know, kind of religious big words, but godless simply means that you are without him. You are without God. In the same way that you might describe uh, your aunt's meal, it's got no flavor, it's flavorless, it's lacking something. In the same way, God is displeased with those who are without him who do not have him at the center of their life. And unrighteousness is really just a way to communicate your actions, your behaviors, the right and wrong things that you do, but specifically to other people. And so when you think about these two words, godless and unrighteous, what we really get is the exact opposite of what Jesus said in his famous teaching, that the greatest thing that we can do as human beings is to love God and love people. To be godless and unrighteous is the exact opposite of what Jesus said every human being should do. And that is what God is angry at. And at the root of that is because we suppress it. We know who God is, but at the same time, we don't want to know who God is. And Paul says, look, the reason why you can know who God is is because of creation. His invisible attributes have become visible. They're clearly seen in the created world. In other words, it's like a detective who comes into the scene of the crime and they begin to kind of dust the walls. They dust the tables. They dust the doorknobs, the glassware, right? They're looking for fingerprints. And Paul is saying, man, if you were to dust the walls of creation, if you were to dust the tables of creation, you would find God's fingerprints everywhere. The clues about him are seen all over creation and we know this. We know that we are meaningful people. We know that we are people with a purpose. Life has a purpose to it. And at the end of the day, deep down inside, we all know that we belong to our creator. Paul says these two things are very true here in Romans 1, that we need God and that we answer to God. But we suppress it. We hold it down. How many of you right now, man, it, it, you could just admit your life has been about this. You deny God. Are any of you right now in a moment where you can just finally release? Stop holding down. That's what the word suppress the truth means. You're holding something down. How many of you right now, you're just, you're just tired of doing that? What would your life look like in just a year if you began to release what you know deep down inside is true about God and is true about you? You see, when we think about people who don't know God, it's not so much that they need more information about God, but they need to stop suppressing what they already know. For those of you who are Christians, maybe you can rewind the tape a little bit and go back to that day when you first believed in Jesus and said yes to him and, and no to yourself and turned from your sin and began to follow him. Was it because you discovered something new? Or was it really because you just stopped suppressing what you already knew was true from the very beginning? I think that's also true of our culture today. Our culture doesn't need more evidence for God. We need less suppressing of what we already have. Are some of you tired of suppressing the truth? Because this is what we do. We live in denial. We deny God. And this is why we do it. This is why we live this way. Paul gives us the answer. We worship the creation rather than the creator. Look what he says there in Romans 1.23. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man, birds, four-footed animals, and reptiles. 
Paul says we've swapped. To exchange is to swap out. In other words, we've, we've turned from the creator and we've become infatuated with the creation. I'll say no to the giver of the gifts and I'll just take the gifts. Instead of worshiping the creator, I'll just I'll worship the creation. I love what he made. I'll just take that for myself. And that is what we do. That is why we live in denial because we would rather have what he made than him himself. Which ironically, when you think about it, the reason why God gave us was the creation was that we would know him. And the very thing that God gave to us to know him, we use to ignore him. We'll settle for the gifts. Screw the giver. That is what we say. It's what it means for us to live in denial. Now, I know this passage feels a little strange, right? Reptiles, four-footed animals, birds. What, what is Paul getting at? Well, remember, he's writing to a group of Christians in Rome. Rome was the empire of the gods. They had gods for everything. And so it would have been common if you walked out the street, you would have seen statues, small figurines. You could have gone to temples for all kinds of creatures and seen people there worshiping them. You could have gone to work to a neighbor's home and it would have been very common for you to see idols everywhere. And this, friends, is what the Bible calls the greatest sin and it's idolatry. It is when we turn away our love and worship from God and we give it to something else. And this isn't just Rome's problem. This is all of humanity's problem. We've been doing this from the very beginning. Even if you go back all the way to Exodus, where God called his people out of Egypt, he set them free. He gave them a new identity, a new life, a new home. And there in Exodus 20, the very famous Ten Commandments. The first command is this. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the place of slavery. Do not have other gods besides me. Now, the first reading of that can make us kind of feel like, man, God, God sounds like a little insecure up there. Like no other gods? But what, what, is, what is he so afraid of? What's he so insecure about? But it's not that he's insecure. You see, God, when he says no other gods beside me, He's calling for our allegiance. He's calling for our loyalty. And again, that might feel like a little too much, but the truth is God calls for us to be loyal to him. Why? Because he has been loyal to us. God is devoted to you and calls for you to be devoted to him. But we're not. You see, in our state of denial, we make these idols. Now, again, you, you still might be thinking, idols, man. I, now, I, I've been around the world. I've gone to other temples. I, I've seen ancient ruins, right? I, I, I've seen statues of other gods, but I don't have idols. And you might be right. You see, you don't really turn to idols like physical figurines that maybe they were doing in Rome, but you turn things into idols. You see, an idol is any good thing. An idol is any good created thing that we make too much of a thing. It's a good thing that becomes too much of a thing in our life. And we can do this with anything. That's a lot of things I just said. You know, John Calvin, a very famous Christian writer and theologian said, our hearts are idol making factories. Anything can become an idol. Anything good in our life, we can just turn to and put all of our hope in it all of our dreams in it, all of our love in it, all of our attention in it, all of our adoration and all of our life goes into this thing. And we say to it, give to me. But at the end of the day, only God can. We worship the creation rather than the creator. Anything can become an idol. Marriage can become an idol. Some of you are thinking right now, man, if I, if I can just get to that moment when I am finally married, man, life would just make sense. Y'all, there are some married people here at this church that will let you know the truth about that. I mean, imagine just for a second, like it, I, I'm on a, I got date night going on. And of course, because the way the world is, it's date night at home. So Ash and I are there at the table. We got Thai food on deck. I'm slurping on some delicious pineapple curry because that's my favorite Thai dish. Ashley, my wife, who I love, she got her pad thai going. Of course, I'm taking a little bit of hers. 
And at one point, I just stop slurping my meal, and I just look up at Ashley. And I say, Ashley, be my everything. Make me complete. Make me whole. Fix everything in my life. (laughs) Do you know what I've just done? I have put immense expectations on her, too great of expectations on her. She will be crushed by having to live up to those expectations. I've taken a good thing, our love, our life together, and I've made it the thing. It's become an idol. And that's what Paul is saying here. This word, exchange the glory. Glory in the Greek means doxa. That's what the word is. Doxa means weight. It means significance. In other words, we have exchanged the significance of God and we have placed it on good things. We've made too much of it. Marriage can be an idol. Parenting can be an idol in which everything revolves around your kids. Sex can become an idol. Oh, what a good thing. But it can become an idol when everything revolves around your desires, your demands, what you feel like you need right now in the moment. Your sexuality could become an idol in which everything revolves around who you think you are and how you should express yourself. Retirement can become an idol in which you just fantasize all the time about just being done with everything and away from everyone. Church, listen now, church can become an idol. If you don't believe me, just read the book of Galatians. Paul writes a letter to people who made an idol out of religious acts. Your political party, listen, Your political party can become an idol. And oh, don't we live in that world right now where so many of us say, man, unless this person or unless this candidate can just lead us, then finally we'll be okay. Because if they're not in control, then everything else will spiral out of control. Your political party, careful, can become an idol. How many of you are there right now? How many? I know this doesn't sit easy with us. It bothers us. In fact, this week, just in preparing this, man, I was disturbed thinking about my own life, my own false gods, my own idols. And there was a moment in my time of reflection, God just came to me and he said, Fredo, you know what you worship? You worship comfort over me. And he's right. Listen, I I live to have just a comfortable life. I want to be at ease. I don't want to be disturbed. I don't want things to be unstable. I don't want things to rock too much. I don't like challenges. And so when the world is the way it is, I just kind of detach and retreat to myself because I just want to be cozy. I live and worship at the idol of comfort. And And I say this, I may not say this verbally, but I say this subconsciously as I'm praying to God, like, God, I want to grow, but I don't want the growing pains. God, I want to mature and become wise, but I don't want to go through the hard decisions. I want the crown without the thorns. Give me all the wins, but none of the losses. I worship at the idol of comfort. And some of you might might just be thinking right now, like, well, that's not that bad, Fredo, but let me tell you, it is scary what I can justify in my mind doing in order to protect that idol. As Paul says, claiming to be wise, they became fools. It's scary what I can justify saying to my wife, to my friends, to my family. All is a way just to ensure that I remain comfortable. It can do dangerous things to us. We worship the creation. Now what happens when we do this? Let's be honest. Paul makes it very clear, our idols rob us of our life. That's what happens. Our idols rob us of our life. Notice what he says there in verses 21 and 22. Instead, their thinking became worthless and their hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. In other words, there's something going on inside with their heads and their hearts. You can't always see it on the outside, but on the inside, something is happening to their thinking and to their hearts. And it's a decay. It's a destruction. It's this subtle loss of everything that you are. When you think about our, 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 our idols, they dehumanize us. Our idols take away what makes you, you. You lose a sense of who you are. The more you worship, the more you bow down to your good things in life, 
the less you become yourself. Psalm 115 makes this really clear. Their idols are silver and gold made by human hands. They have mouths but can't speak, eyes but cannot see. They have ears but cannot hear, noses but cannot smell. They have hands but cannot feel, feet but cannot walk. They cannot make a sound with their throats. And listen to this. Those who make them are just like them, as all who trust in them. You see what the psalmist is saying is what Paul is saying. Idols have no life in themselves. They look like and they feel like in the beginning that your life is full, your life is great. You even have this feeling of euphoria and control, which is what we all want. But in the end, there's nothing in them. But they take everything from you. And the reason why that is, because an idol, a good thing, is a part of life, but an idol is not the source of life. Our idols, these good things that we make too much of a thing, they are a part of life, but they themselves are not the source of life. Somebody else is. The creator is. The giver of the gifts is. The God who we deny is the source of everything. But what happens when we bow down to these things, they take everything from us until there is nothing left of you. You're not who you were beforehand. I remember hearing a story a number of years ago. Someone was asking me and a handful of other people, how do you think you can tell who the alcoholic is at the dinner table? He said, imagine eight people around a table enjoying a fancy meal together. Which one is the alcoholic? And we're thinking, well, hey, um, I don't know, the person who gets a little tipsy, right? The one who drinks too much. And the person talking to us was like, well, sure, maybe. But consider for just a moment, what would happen if you took the alcohol off the table? Take that red wine off the table. You see, the one who really is the addict, the the alcoholic, the one who has given too much to this good thing is the one who starts to squirm when the alcohol is taken from them. The one who starts to rock back and forth. The one who starts to look at all the other tables as people enjoy their fish and cabernet. That's the person who's addicted. You see, it's become too much of a thing And who they are is slowly being taken away from them. And we see this in people's lives, man. You you know people, you know addicts in your life who are living in denial. And you're like, man, you are not yourself. This thing that you love too much, first you thought it would give you comfort. Second, you thought it would give you control. And now it has taken everything from you. So how do we move forward? How are we going to get out of this kind of state? Because it's not just enough, you know, to hear a church message and be like, oh gosh, of course, I'm not a good person. I got idols. Yes, what else? (laughs) What else is new? It would be just a religious thing if we stopped there. But no, we need to move further. As bad as idols are, they can also be helpful. Because listen now, we need to allow our idols to reveal our deeper longings that only God can fulfill. Allow our idols to reveal our deeper longings that only God can fulfill. Consider for a moment that we worship, we all worship at the idol of social media because deep down inside, we long to be connected. We worship at the idol of our political party because deep down inside, we all long for a world that is marked by safety and fairness and justice and that which is good. We worship at the idols of our sports. Oh my gosh, God have mercy on me. A huge Laker fan. (laughs) And even some of you are like, man, when is this over? I got the game on coming soon. But we worship at the idol of our sports because deep down inside, we long to be a part of something that is bigger than ourselves. We worship at the idol of our appearance because deep down inside, we long to be seen and noticed. We don't want to be ignored. You see, our idolatry It's a cry for help. It's a cry that we need to be rescued. Some of you are just drowning in anxiety right now. And maybe it's because you worship at the idol of the future. And deep down inside, you long to know that everything is going to be okay. 
Maybe even some of you like me, man, you, 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 uh, you struggle with guilt. I do. And I worship at the idol of the past because deep down inside, I, I long to know that I just haven't screwed things up too badly. I long to know that what I have done and what I even continue to do at times isn't too bad for God still to make me right. Our idolatry is a way for us to cry out for help, which is why when you see people living in denial, show them mercy, show them compassion because you live like them too. We all need salvation, which is why when Paul says there in verse 21, though they knew God, they did not glorify him as God or show gratitude. What he's saying is we know, we know God, but we don't treat him as God. In other words, we don't give to God what is due to him. That's what it means to glorify him. We need to rightfully give to God what is his. Now, you might ask, well, what is God's? Everything. (laughs) Rightfully give to God what is his. Everything is his. Everything that you are and everything that you have belongs to him. When Jesus says to his disciples and anyone listening, deny yourself, pick up your cross and follow me, he is calling on us, And saying that everything we have belongs to him. Now that might feel a bit much. But here's the beauty of Christianity and the story of the Bible about a God who loves you so much that he first has given you everything he is and everything he has. Sandals Church, this is the fundamental difference between idols and God. Our idols take, and they take, and they take, but God gives, and he gives, and he gives. Idols take, God gives. God gives us so much that he gave us his son, and his son Jesus gives us so much that he gives until he's got his one last breath left. Jesus gives so much until he is willing to to be at a point where he is giving up his life and dying for you on a cross because of what you deserve and what I deserve. This is how much Jesus gives. He gives to the point of death so that we, as we come to trust in him, can have life. When our idols take, God gives. That is good news. When our idols demand of us, God is devoted to us. When our idols are greedy, God is gracious. And I want to say this, especially to some of you who are heavy hearted today. There are, there are many in our church, many who are watching, who are dealing with grief, dealing with the difficulties of life, man, you are just struggling. And let me say this to you. Your idols, they do not weep with you. Your idols do not cry with you. Your money does not weep for you. Your wealth does not do it. Your career, your success, your sex life, none of that weeps for you. None of that will cry for you. But there is a God who does. There is a God who weeps with you. There is a God who knows how to grieve with you and his name is Jesus. He himself knows your affliction. He knows your pain. He knows what it's like to be where you are at right now. This is why, out of so many reasons, why he is such a better God than the false idols we turn to all the time. He's a God who can weep with you. And I'm reminded of this even today. A few days ago, I'm on the phone with a a close family friend. He lost his mom to COVID-19. And we're just weeping on the phone. Driving home from work, he wasn't even able to be with her. He couldn't see her for over a month. There is a God who weeps with him, who grieves with him. Our idols will not do that for us. So where do we go from here? You see, the question now is not so much, do you have idols, but how many do you have? How long is your list? I got a long list. And the truth is, as we wrap up, you need to name your idols so that you can begin to heal. 
We need to name the idol so that we can begin to heal. You know, if you've been around Sandals Church long enough, there's a phrase we use a lot. You can't heal until you get real. And the same is true here. If you are unwilling to name it, then you will never be freed from it. You need to name your idols. The other option is clear. Continue to live in denial. Continue to suppress what you know is true and remain in the bondage of worshiping something that isn't really God. That at the end of the day doesn't really love you and will just take everything from you. Or right now you can begin the process to name your idols. What are the things in your life that if you went without, you would lose yourself? What are those things? Name them. Fill in this blank. If I only had this, then I know my soul and my life would be good. Name that idol. Sandals Church, let us name our idols by the grace of God. Let's do that now as we go to him in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you in need of help. God, would you help us and pull us out of this state of denial so that we can begin to live in the freedom of truth and the freedom of life? But God, that's going to require that we name our idols. Help us to name it so that we can be freed from it now. Jesus, you are such a better God. Help us to name our idols so that we can begin in small ways to feel the freedom of living in the truth. Holy Spirit, would you do this in our hearts now? Holy Spirit, would you work in some of our lives where we have been suppressing truth our entire lives so that we can begin maybe for the first time to see you, Jesus, clearly? We pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Love you, Sandals Church. Grace and peace. Thanks so much for watching the message today. And you know, if it was impactful in any way, I want to invite you right now to share that message with someone and let them know how it was impactful to you because it can help them become real with themselves, God, and others. And maybe you want to partner with Sandals Church in another way. I'd love to invite you to donate today by going to donate.sc. We are so glad that you joined us and we hope to see you again.